Peace and blessings, family. This, this is your brother, Rasar M. Hotep, with the Martin Delaney Center for Egyptology. And today is Wednesday, a.k.a. Ujama. And we are going to talk about something which I call the theory of special social relativity in relationship to the concept of race and identity in ancient Egypt. So I appreciate each and every one of you for joining this conversation. And we have a lot to discuss. So all that and more when we return in just a moment. want to say peace and blessings to each and every one of you for uh, listening today. And um, if you are alive, and of course, those of you who will be catching the archives. And so uh, this talk that I'm about to do now, um, I was actually supposed to be doing on Brother Sonnetter's program. He had called me yesterday and asked me uh, to come on the show. So I blocked off some time. But for some reason, he hasn't gotten back to me. So I was like, well, since I have the time blocked, I will uh, just do it on my program. And uh, I originally had something else to be shown here today. But it, in this show was uh, pre-recorded. So it's going to instead premiere tonight at 9 p.m. And I'm going to be uh, addressing uh, a, a comment or a series of comments made by a YouTube uh, person uh, by the name of Comgiverse, who uh, he makes a lot of videos about, you know, uh, Africa, ancient and modern, and uh, there are, let me see, this one in particular has to deal with this this nation of the reconstruction um, and, and how to go about reconstructing. So I think that uh, this individual's on, you know, a, a good start, but he's a, he's far from uh, knowing the details of how uh, this thing called uh, historical comparative linguistics is actually uh, done and conducted. So that's going to be discussed on tonight. Uh, so those of you who have joined the Patreon page, you know, um, you've already seen it. It's already, it's been up for a couple of weeks now. And so it will premiere tonight for the, for the general public. And so, as always, I want to give a shout out to those of you who have made yourselves known on the chat. And so we're streaming live from three locations today on Twitter or X, uh, the Asar Imhotep YouTube page, as well as the Asar Imhotep Facebook page. So, um, and, but only the YouTube and the Facebook allows for the, the comments to show up here. So if you are on Twitter or you're watching and you have a comment, uh, just hop on over here to, to YouTube and uh, make yourself known. But love and light always to Sister Mika Wood, who is joining us all the way down in Florida. And Brother Zane Montego is in the building. 
and sister Gigi all the way on the west coast is in the building and we will learn together with Obam he is in the building peace and blessings to you uh Dasharab is in the building peace and love to you our good brother over here on the east coast uh the jed m ankh hekara is in the building and this is going to be a very very informative uh conversation but before you know we get started i want to make sure that each and every one of you That's right. Make sure that you hit the like button and uh, share the show so that more people can join us live and get some of this good, uh, loving energy and education and the like. And also just one last announcement before we go. Uh, I am blessed to be uh, on a not necessarily a panel but amongst a group of individuals who will be uh, providing some information for Black History Month, which is October. And I'm just going to play the commercial from our uh, good brother, uh, Sankofa, excuse me, Sankofa, brother Shakara uh, out of the UK. So love it. God Kush TV presents Sankofa, the future of Black History, a unique Black History Month online series exploring all dimensions of time as we chronicle the Black past, command the Black present, and empower the Black future. Workshops include The Future is Black, Why is Black History Under Attack? With Shakara, we create value, the ingenuity of enslaved Africans. With Robin Walker, Ancestral Calling, Agriculture, and the Apobo Library Initiative with Aya Eveli, Quantum Field Theory as African Heritage with Asa Imhotep. For full information including dates and the registration, visit gotkushtv.com. We have made history. We are making history. There is history still to be made. Sankofa, the future of Black history. A Black History Love series not to be missed. That is right. Make sure that you go to gotkushtv.com for more details and um, when they will be, each lecture will be premiering live uh, in your time zone. Uh, um, for the To get a better understanding, it's going to be on every Wednesday evening. Uh, Shakara starts off, Sister Aya, uh, second, no, she's third, I believe. Uh, Brother Robin Walker is second, I'm last. Uh, on the last Wednesday. So it's going to be uh, 7 p.m. London time and 2 p.m. Eastern time. And so, but however, if you, you know, pay for, you know, whatever uh, lecture, you know, saying that you want to see, um, you if you can't catch it live, you still have access to the archive. So you can you can see it, you know, anytime. Uh, you need. So make sure that you go to uh, gotcushtv.com. Again, I will be speaking on uh, quantum field theory as African heritage. And so, which is the title of an upcoming book. And so, yeah. But anyway, love and light to sister. Is it Malkia or Malkia? I don't know how you would say it, but I'm going to say Malkia. Or Makia Wamungu. Uh, I don't know how she would uh, tell us how it sounds, but um, love and light to you. Welcome to the program and our good sister Al Kabilan Mine. And <laughs> she says she's on time this time. Indeed, indeed. Uh, and check out, she also has a YouTube uh, channel and Matter of fact, uh, she's been gone for a while, but she has returned back on the YouTube scene. And I believe I am her first interview coming back. 
And so uh, we just did an uh, interview not too long ago. So make sure that you look up Al Cable Online on YouTube so that you can see uh, it. And she said that I said it correctly the first time. All right. I appreciate it. Love and light. And thank you for joining. Uh, so we're going to get right into it. So I am going to share my screen. So this is a, going to be a presentation today. And we're going to go all the way to the beginning. And so, so I'll just wait a second. Matter of fact, I need to turn on my phone so I can kind of just double check and make sure that everything is kosher on the YouTube front. And just double check and make sure that let me just turn that volume down so I don't be getting this feedback. Uh, and I'd rather it be full screen for y'all. So let me just uh, do that. So those of you who are on your phone, you can better uh, see it. So let me do it like that. And peace and blessings to Ancoma the Jed. Thank you for joining. And SC44, uh, peace and blessings to you uh, for joining the conversation as well. So. Uh, as I mentioned, the, the title of the conversation today is called The Theory of Social Special Relativity. And so I got the idea of social relativity, of course, from, you know, Einstein's famous uh, theory of relativity uh, regarding, you know, gravity. Well, the, the, the general relativity has to deal with gravity, but the, uh, the special relativity has to deal with the speed of light, the invariance in regards to the laws of nature and how essentially the speed of light is a time limit, um, not necessarily a time limit, a, uh, a, a limit in space in regards to how fast things can travel. And so uh, time and space itself being um, integrated in a, a very real way, um, depending on the speed and the mass of the object, they will experience time in, in different ways. So regardless, you know, uh, in two observers can be watching an event and they will uh, have different conceptualizations of when that event happened because of the phenomenon called relativity and i am saying essentially that you know by analogy it is it is similar to when we're talking about this concept of race so as you all know i have uh written a book titled race and identity in ancient egypt volume one towards a meaning for the place named kemet and many of you have already received uh, the text and have begun uh, reading the text. And so we'll probably do some shows in the future, just kind of going through the first few chapters and answering any questions that you may have. And so the impetus for writing this book uh, in the subtitles uh, towards a meaning for the place name, if I didn't say it already, but the impetus for writing this began, you know, in the uh, late 1990s when uh, I was uh, graduating high school and going into college and entered this academic space and where there was a, you know, kind of a, a big uproar and attack on Africana studies. Um, and, you know, these this large academic attack on Sheikh Anti Jok, the Ophala Vinga, and even uh, the late Dr. Mark but now who wrote the book Black Athena. And this spawned a, a very deep and curious interest in the argument surrounding the race and identity of the ancient Egyptians. And so during that conversation, you know, the meaning of the, the place name Kemet became an essential argument for those on the African-centered side uh, claiming the, the Africanness and the Blackness of the ancient Egyptians. Egyptians. And so this started a long series of uh, 
of discussions and, and research projects that has lasted several decades. Uh, you know, I guess I'm telling my age now. And, and so now it culminates into a series, which is uh, a, a books to be published titled Race and Identity in Ancient Egypt. So this is the first in a three part series. And so volume two, we'll discuss a little bit about it in the coming slides. So um, for those of you who have the book, you know that in the preface of the book, I cite this text here, you know, in, in preparation for volume two. So although the, the, the book title is Race and Identity in Ancient Egypt, volume one, I really don't deal too hard with the racial question of uh, ancient Egypt in this volume because it is a linguistic analysis and etymological exercise uh, tracing the name of the place named Kemet and then then having that discussion on whether it relates to the the, the identification of the people uh, in ancient Egypt or ancient Kemet itself. And so, but in the preface, I kind of, you know, give you all some hints on what's going to be discussed in volume two. And so, you know, when you're doing, and, and, and I should say this, let me, let me back up just a second, that, you know, with everything that I do, I, I try to instill into each and every one of you that there is a research process. So this, this text, Race and Identity in Ancient Egypt, volume one, is in part a text on how to conduct research in the linguistic space and, and apply it, you know, to uh, questions in regards to ancient Egyptian uh, philosophy, anthropology, and, and other areas, right? So, you know, throughout this conversation that we're going to be having now, I'm going to be having it within the context of research methods, right? Because what I have found in these, especially these online conversations with a, with a lot of folks that are in opposition to the conclusions in which I have reached, is that they are not very good at doing research and, and understanding nuance and, and and, and, and where to go to find information and the like, and how certain things bring about certain questions and, and, and how you have to adjust throughout the research process, right? And so, and, and many of them believe for some reason that, you know, like, like the conversations that we have in these recent times, like they're new to me. Remember that I've been doing this for over 20 something years almost 23, 24 years, right? And uh, so I, I've, I've these conversations have been with people around the world um, in, you know, amongst linguists, amongst uh, anthropologists, amongst geneticists, paleoanthropologists, uh, you know, so we're, we're dealing with a wide range of, of, of research questions over this, this this essentially 25 year time span. And so this is what you're going to get, you know, this accumulated data over these three volumes. And so what you see on the screen right here is one of those essential things that we have to get our minds around when we're talking about the identity of the ancient Egyptians. So this is a, an excerpt from a PhD dissertation titled Egypt's Encounter with the West, Race, Culture, and Identity by Dr. William A. Cooney, right? And this was published in 2011. And so he says something in the text about the, the idea of um, identity in ancient Egypt, thus you know, the, the title of his uh, PhD dissertation. So he says, being Egyptian in the ancient world, therefore, is a complex phenomenon which cannot be tied exclusively to primordialist or instrumentalist perspectives of ethnic identity, but is quite clearly a conflation of both of them. And I have bolded in red. 
An Egyptian was not merely someone who lived within the boundaries of Egypt, nor a person who practiced Egyptian religion or spoke Egyptian. An Egyptian could be all of these or none of these. Right. So, you know, the. In essence, it seems like what he's saying here is that, you know, when we're talking about an, an Egyptian, for the most part, you're just talking about somebody who has citizenship in a state. But there there really wasn't any. And there's other texts which I'll be citing in volume two, uh, which which argue that there was no collective you know, identification in ancient Kemet. And we'll talk about the strengths and weaknesses of, of those perspectives at a later time. But let me continue. Like ethnic identity in the modern world, ethnic identity in ancient, in the ancient world was equally nebulous. That said, despite the often inclusive nature of Egyptian society, the Egyptians were also prone to exclude groups whom they considered to be different from themselves. This has created a lively debate within scholarly literature on the degree to which the ancient Egyptians were racist, right? And so there's, and, and you have to read the, uh, see the bibliography in the text to, to, uh, to trace those sources. And uh, two of those books I actually have, um, I don't have the uh, Tyson Smith, uh, whatever that source is, but the other two I do. And um, so so the, the 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 question is, okay, so if what what does it mean? So the this this pertains to the question of what does it mean to be an Egyptian, right? So to, so since those those individuals are claiming that the word Kemet itself means black people, and there are others who claim that Kemet means black land. Let's deal with the black people argument, because this brings up the the idea of, you know, um, the, the the race of the people. Right. And so, you know, uh, how I articulated in the text, you know, when in, in the preface is like, how does this affect the our conceptualization of what makes an Egyptian, especially since we have archaeological evidence of people coming out of the Levant? And that is the Middle East, right, where kind of Israel, Palestine, Syria is. They have been moving into Egypt since pre-dynastic times, right? And if they are of a different hue in terms of skin tone and color, and they're coming in in waves of, of varying degrees since the fourth millennium BCE, what does that do to the makeup of the Egyptians themselves in terms of uh, genetic input and phenotypic output? And how does that pertain to the concept of Kemet, meaning black people? Right. So so these are the kinds of questions that we're, we're posing and putting forth, you know, into the conversation. Right. And so what I what I want to do in this conversation is I'm going to rehash something, right? So this what I'm what I'm about to discuss here has has been a part of the research, the abundance of research questions that I have been dealing with since the beginning, right? And so remember that this conversation we're having today in part has to deal with research methods and in and research considerations, the kinds of questions that you ask when you are involved, uh, you know, as an academic in the research process. So what, what you're seeing on the screen right now is on the left hand side, that is, is a screenshot from a Facebook post that I posted in 2018. So and for those of you who don't know my government name, my government name is Harold Johnson. And so so that's the name that you see right there. And so um, and so this was posted on November the 23rd, 2018. And you'll be able to, for those who are Facebook friends with me, can verify. You can go to my page and type in one of the keywords and hopefully, you know, it comes up for you. 
right? So this, this post has to deal with this concept of it in in it in is is going through the source material for which this post was made for that that uh, allowed me to come up with this concept called you know saying a theory of special social relativity right in regards to this this racial concept so so it is it is asking the questions that i'm posting here so the the on the left hand side is the screenshot uh, the cutout screenshot of the actual post on Facebook. And so to help you all better read it, I have, you know, just copied and pasted it and on the on the right hand side and I'll be reading from it. So. All right. So. So remember, this is 2018. To, it is 2023 today. Right. And I state in the in on the Facebook post. I have been researching this topic of the meaning of Kemet for 20 years, right? So that at, at 2018, it was 20 years, right? So I have approached this from practically every angle. Through the debates and discourses for the past 20 years on this question, I had to do some deep study into African naming practices. In science, we look for patterns and we create formulas to describe the rules that bring about the patterns we see in nature. The question is, and, and, and so this, this has always been the one of the main questions that I asked 20 years ago. Does Africa, and it should be, do African people or does African people have a tradition, therefore a pattern of naming themselves Right. And I have it in capital letters here themselves in terms as an ethnic identifier based on them on their physical characteristics, for example, skin color, hair type, butt size, etc. The question was never do Africans call singular persons by physical characteristics. And so let me let me put that in context. So the question has always been. When, when African people name themselves as an individual, as a clan, as a village, as a nation, do they, do we have a tradition across Africa of people naming themselves based upon physical characteristics? And so you would come across these these people who who don't understand, who can't comprehend the nature of the conversation, who would would in re, in in trying to rebuttal, you know, things in regards to this question, they keep coming up with with answers of, well, this person is named Kim and this person is named Red. I'm not talking about individual people because we don't know who named them. Was that a birth name or was that a given name? Right? We're not talking about individuals. The question is, does African people have a tradition of naming themselves as an ethnic identifier? I put that in parentheses. Based on their physical characteristics. Right? And so the question was never do Africans call singular persons by physical characteristics? I don't know how that becomes the center of one's debate. The question as stated already regards a population's self-identity. So how do African populations self-identify? That's the question, right? And hold on one second. As I, there we go. All right. So so that was this part here on the left hand side. So that's that's what you see on the right. So I continue. So this this is the second paragraph here in studying this research question. One of the books I purchased is titled African Anthroponymy, an ethnopragmatic and morphophonological study of personal names in Akan and some African societies by 
a linguist, Samuel Gayasi Obing. So when you ask that kind of question in terms of how African groups name themselves as a population, then of course you have to do literature review. Well, are there any studies that have been done that record African names on all levels in terms of how do how do African people name their children, right? You know, what is the process of initiation names? Like what are the motiv motivations behind that? How do clans name themselves? How do nations name themselves in the African context, right? So you have to go through the literature and this is just one source that I, I used and referenced when um, when I started this research project, right? And so I continue. In the chapter on birth circumstances names on page 42, there is a subsection titled Physical Characteristics Anthroponyms. And anthroponyms are, you know, uh, names, you know, for, for human beings, right? Uh, so in this section, scan below and we'll see the photo in just a bit you will see that we cannot take our western conceptualizations of race and try to impose them on african realities because for example all the african americans who are brown in complexion would be called whites by the akan many of you have visited ghana so remember this is a facebook post it's not an article or anything many of you have visited ghana know that they call us brony this same term is used to categorize the fulani who we in the west would consider quote unquote black people but notice the fulani do not call themselves brony that is a description another people therefore the akan call the fulani so when we are discussing Kemet and naming practices, we always have to look at how people in Africa self-identify, not what other people call them, right? So in the research process, you're going to have to distinguish, you know, the, the, the naming process from other people versus the, uh, the naming process that the people have for themselves, right? And so I give a little bit of linguistics showing that 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 word here that's highlighted in red brony comes from a BR root um, in in the words of Boro and brony. Right. And you can find it in Sumerian as bur, meaning light to glow, shine um, in the nasal form, merut, meaning rays and beams. And then habeb, meaning light in Middle Egyptian and the MU stands for Middle Egyptian in the the B or the M turns into W, so it's wer wer, wu, meaning sunlight. And Proto Bantu is bad to illuminate, to shine. And a variant of that same root in Sumerian is reduplicated, and so you see a partial reduplication. But babar, meaning to be white. And so what you see here is a uh, partial reduplication. And so, right, this, and I, and I note here that the root in Akan is used for things that are white or bright in color, like yams and plantains. So, and, and we'll see some examples of that in, uh, in, in, uh, in the next couple of slides, right? So, um, in the original post, I just took a, uh, I scanned the entire spot but it's going to be hard to read in this image form so i typed out the the top part so this comes from page 42 of the text that i that i cited earlier right so in a con society and this is uh dr obing speaking here in a con society one's physical characteristics at birth may form one of the basis of one's name a child born with a light skin may be named brony one from beneath the horizon, right? Or white-skinned, or infurani, therefore a fulani. One born with a dark skin may be called tuntun, or kobire. Some anthroponyms of physical characteristics are listed on, 
from table 2.17 below. And so uh, just a side note, that word tum tum is cognate with the word kim, meaning black in ancient Egyptian. And for those of you who have uh, my text, uh, I, I provide the demonstration in uh, Appendix A, actually at the end of chapter three, and in Appendix A, as well as uh, Appendix E, which is the last chapter, you know, of the text, right? So this is the table from uh, Table 2.17 that uh, the author just mentioned. So you can see at the top of the um, thing, and remember that the, the author is himself an icon, and he is also a linguist. So this is a linguistic work. And so so he understands very well, you know, the details of what we we're talking about here. So um, in the first column, you get the meaning. In the second column, you get the actual name. I'm sorry. The physical characteristic is on the left hand side, the first column. The actual name is in the middle. And on the right hand column is the actual meaning of the icon name or word right in the center so to to discuss fair like if somebody is fair complexion the icon would uh name them aboro aboro meaning from beyond the horizon you know so you're talking about that kind of twinkling that dawning light you know uh of the like if you, like when the sun is just rising over the horizon so you have a similar concept dealing with the ak and aket in in ancient kemet right and so uh, a second word for fair complexion is brony which we just mentioned so you're talking about white or brown skinned person so as i said when, if you are that you know brown to light skin range you are called white you're called brony and so that aboro and brony they both had this br root that we saw going back you know here so these are just dialectical variations of the same ancestor root right and so that's why it deals with white because this this origin has to deal with a word for light and so if you were slim you'll be atai atai i don't know how to, uh, somebody of icon can better pronounce it than i and then thin kitewa you know meaning small somebody who is very small ata twin or small if you are dark complexion, tum tum, black, right? Um, if you are big, okay, see ya. Big, huge. Physically challenged, bafon, crippled, tall, tin tin, right? So you're, you're seeing here that if uh, from the Anakan perspective, people who are brown skin or light skin are considered whites, right? And uh, this is from uh, the post uh, uh, that same post that I that I mentioned beforehand, and so I, I essentially say here that I, you know, part of doing my due diligence is to check multiple sources uh, for for concepts and claims, right? So uh, there was a, another. There's a if you're learning the tree language. There's a there's a text out there and, and some audio files that you can learn. Tui is a basic course in Tui, and so it, it further confirms this this particular concept. So here is a a screenshot of the text, and so I highlighted in the yellow the actual uh, uh, terms that we're going to be known. So you, we see here that boro de meaning plantain, your European yam. It has that boro, be that BR root. And then bororo, meaning bread, because, you know, bread is essentially, um, or at least on the inside, essentially, you know, white. Borofo or borofo, English or European language, right? And then we we go down to, to the bottom. Aburo, meaning corn corn or maize so you can see corn or maize is kind of a yellowish white right and uh underneath it says aburo kiri which means europe or america so that's why this this is how the word for white becomes the word for foreigner 
So when um, so a lot of when 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 African Americans come there and, and they they say a variation of this word, you know, it essentially means white, and then it's first applied to the European. But since you know, like you have this term here, Aburo Kiri, it is for Europe and America, and so you know they translate it in English kind of as foreigner, but essentially it's really a white person, right? So Oburoni, so a European, right? And so, so, <laughs> so remember that uh, according to uh, the Obing, Dr. Obing, that the term brony, uh, you know, meaning beneath the horizon or one beneath the horizon or white skinned refers to the Fulani. Now keep this in mind. So, like, so here's here's uh, some photos, some variation of photos of the Fulani, and you can see that by every American measure, these are black folks. But in Africa, <laughs> the Fulani are white folks, and and it's going to be hard for you to wrap around your brain. Because, you know, you, you may be so indoctrinated, uh, you know, by living and existing in Europe or the United States. But, you know, this this is why when, when you know, as an Africologist, we always ground ourselves in African cultures and African languages first. And, and, and then, you know, uh, contrast and compare with concepts outside of that when we're discussing people. So you you know, from an, from an icon, West African perspective, you couldn't call Fulani black people, at least, you know, because they're, they're white, right? And so anywhere this, this light brown, reddish um, to white color, that's all, you know, yellowish, all of that is, is one range that they just simply call white. All right, so this is a Fulani girl right here on the left bottom. Uh, Fulani man here, another Fulani. So you can see it's it's this this reddish brown, you know, color here, right? So here's here's some more, and on the right hand side is you know a a painting of the color of the ancient Egyptians, right? This is going to be very important come later in our conversation, because according to the Akan, ancient Egyptians would be white, right? And technically, according to the ancient Egyptians themselves, they would be whites. And we'll see what we mean in, in, in just a moment. But look at the, 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 the range. And this is of a Libyan uh, mask uh, in ancient Egypt in the, in the later, in the, in the so-called Libyan dynasties. And you can see it, it kind of matches the, the look of the Fulani. I have a different lecture where we talk about that these Libyans in, in reality were Fulani. Uh, but that's a different discussion for a different day. But these are white folks, according to uh, uh, the 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 people in Ghana, for example, right? And and so here's a uh, a bust of King Tut. You know, over here in the United States, this would be black. There's, you know, because you know we include all different you know, kinds of hues within the range of black. But in Africa, this person is white, right? And so this is this is an Egyptian, right, on the right-hand side, and his skin color matches that which you see of King Tutankhamen. So here's here's some more uh, so-called, quote-unquote, Nubians, but this is, this is the, uh, um, the range. These are white folks. Now you you y'all may think that I'm um you know just 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 kind of making stuff up and using one source. So remember that this was a Facebook post. So when I when I posted this back in 2018, y'all know our good brother Jean Claude Bowley. I've had him on the program uh, several times, and I and I cite him uh, quite heavily in a, in a few of my works, and. You know, so so this was his comment 
when when I made that initial post and I and I gave that source which you and those sources which you just saw previously right he said what astonished me when i went to french carabis for the first time i guess the french caribbean i don't know um for the first time is the fact that i found out a lot of people that declare being black whereas for me they are white without any doubt it's this experience that pushed me to consider race as a social construct. That's what he uh, said here. I should have uh, did to see more so you can see. So even Jean-Claude Mboli, and he comes from the Democratic Republic of Congo, he would have called the ancient Egyptians white. And so he was saying that when he first went and he's seeing these brown to light-skinned um, Africans, he called them white and he was confused on why they would call themselves black. Like, like, you know, um, and of course this had to be a, you know, early in, in some time. Cause you know, when you grow up in Africa, you don't, you don't grow up with the, with the kind of, um, there are some issues that we share, but we don't we don't have the same, you know, lens that we look at into the world. So especially if you, you grow up here in the United States and places like Brazil and Europe, you have a very strong racial lens because everything is racialized here. And and so, you know, when you use that term black, they have something else in mind, not what we have in mind. So when he's he's like, what do you mean that you're black? You're white. So Malcolm X is white. Elijah Muhammad is white. Common is white. <laughs> Beyonce is white. Right. Chloe Bailey is white. So um, I was having a a, a you know because you know for those of you who you know are facebook friends with me you know that uh i you know I, I tend to have these conversations in multiple posts so i made another post uh within that same i don't know if it was the same day or if it was in the same week and so so uh, i put some more evidence you know talking about um this this particular concept and so doctors uh, Salim Faraji, uh, you know, who is the new biologist and, and theologian, you know, who wrote the book on Nubian Christianity and some other things that we've had him on the program before. Um, and he's originally out of Philadelphia, but, uh, lives and teaches in California uh, and has been there for like the past 20 years or, or so years, 20 or 30 years. Um, he says, I remember my first trip to northern Ghana. I hung out with a young man. And keep in mind that he 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 used to be married to a Ghanaian woman. So he married, he found his wife in Ghana and they had children and the like. So anyway, so I remember my first trip to northern Ghana. I hung out with a young man who was a part of Kassini people or the Kassini people. In his language, Kasim, he said I was not black but red. I allude to this in my Nubian Kinti book as well. Black is far more nuanced in the diverse cultures of Africa. This is also the case in Sudan and Egypt. You're citing the sources German too. He's saying that's tight. I actually have a German manuscript by Joachim Kugler on the Egyptian origins of the book of Luke in the New Testament that I'm planning to publish with Africa World Press. And then I respond, uh, to him below and i'm just essentially telling him, like we have a different problem here is that we want to lump everybody in the black category whereas the africans don't name it so when that's why it's hard for people like we be having these debates with folks like somalians somalian there's a lot of most somalians don't consider themselves black right because they have a different conceptualization of what what blackness is right they're white and, and it has nothing to do with europeans right so 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 from from an african perspective this is a white woman 
Now, she would come here to the United States and be categorized as black. Right? And so she's within the range of the depictions of, of, of women in ancient Kemet. Right? She's these these two women here are white, according to a lot of uh, African groups. You know, you, you see this um, picture. I think this is Nefertari on the right. Right. Like th these are white people, according to African folks. Right. Now you have the extreme white folks that are that are Europeans, but they ain't running the Europeans at this time. So, so their concept of white are, are those who are, are red to, to, to high yellow is what we call them. And then the extreme is white, you know, or European white, the, you know, the, the Germanic type, the Greek type, right? And so to, to, to these folks, the, even the Khoi San, the Khoi and the San folks, you know, uh, would be considered white because their skin is is you know brown to to very light on average. These are white folks that you're looking at here in the United States. However, they would uh, categorize as blacks, Negroes, the other N word, which we won't say here today, right? So this is this is what I mean by relativity, you know, uh, special social relativity. So the the whole point of this conversation is that when we are having conversations about race and identity in terms of ancient Egypt, we always have to ground ourselves in the African perspective and not the European, because the 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 lens for which African people are thinking in this regard is totally different than how we perceive things living in proximity to, to quote unquote white folks here in the United States. Right. And so since we're talking about the Fulani, you know, as, as we've discussed before, and this is the, the, the Yale theologian and linguist, uh, Dr. Mudupe Odoyoye out of Nigeria. And in this text, the sons of gods and the daughters of men an Afro-Asiatic interpretation of Genesis one through 11. He, he talks about the migrations of the Fulani all throughout North and West Africa, you know, over a time span of hundreds of thousands of years, right? And, and how the name has changed over time, uh, depending upon the time period in a, in a name. So you have that Abore, Bororo, Fulbe, Pulo, Fula, the Haparu in amongst the ancient Egyptians, Abiri, they're the same folks ancestry um, that became the hebrews and the arabs the the word arab is just the word hebrew backwards <laughs> um the aparim right the aparu like these are all the same folks and wherever they go gone they have mixed with the the local populations and that extended the gene pool and it's gone over for thousands of years right and the the great professor, Dr. Abu Bukri Musalam, an Egyptologist out of Senegal, has written several texts. Uh, matter of fact, his PhD dissertation, you know, had to deal with the Egyptian origins of the Fulani. And this is the text form that you see here on the left hand side. Right. And so this is what this translates to from French, the Egyptian origin of the Fulanis. Or the pools, right? And 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 why am I bringing this up? So let's talk about this text right here. This is an article that was published in 1949, and I, I allude to this in in several earlier publications. Um, and this is a, a, the title is called "Pharaonic Survivals Between Lake Chad and the West Coast," and I, I've I've seen other people. Uh, attempt to cite this uncritically and you know with any with any text you always have to to look critically and look at each individual example because there's there's some things in here uh, 
and, and and let me just let me just kind of back off and give you a kind of a overview. So what he is saying in this article that was published in 1949, and that is Dr. G.A. Wainwright, is that the Egyptians, there, there were a number of Egyptians that migrated out of Egypt into Lake Chad. And we have all kinds of evidence that the Egyptians have been going in and out of the Lake Chad area, which is right next door to Nigeria, modern Nigeria, whatnot. And a lot of their culture and things moved from from Egypt uh, via Sudan to Lake Chad, and then it it spread westward. So there's a lot of things that he's connecting here that rightfully is the result of. And this is a European. This ain't an Afrocentrist for all for, for all the silly mofo's, you know, in these internet streets. This is. Um, so there's, there's aspects that we know for sure actually came from Egypt, but there's other aspects, which he's connecting here that are, are not Egyptian per se, that, that these were inherited. These are just a natural culture of their related people. So, so this is why you have to do your own, you have to do the due diligence to be able to separate what is native to these people. And what was brought to them due to migrations of Egyptians in, into West Africa, Western Central Africa, right? So, uh, so you know, I'm just going to read from the beginning. Of course, I'm going to emphasize the highlighted parts here. So he he states here: we start with the Bushongo. For the information which they provide gives the kind of date and road by which influences ultimately from Egypt spread westwards across Africa. The Bushongo are a tribe now living very far away to the south, but with the tradition of having come from the north and actually showing signs of having originated from the Shari River, which flows into Lake Chad from the south. Before leaving the old homeland, tradition tells how they acquired a complex of certain cultural elements among the rest. Uh, I'll just pause. Um, um, uh, let me read that correctly. So before leaving the old homeland, tradition tells how they acquired a complex certain a complex of certain cultural elements. Among the rest was the iron smelting industry, which they still work with the ancient Egyptian bowl bellows that are shown in the paintings of Reknara and which are still used as late as 1837 in southern Kordofan, that's in uh, Sudan, on the road from the Nile to the Shari, which is, you know, um, in, in Chad region. Tradition says that the art was revealed to the Bashongo by a white man, end quote. Their first king, whom they afterwards deified, he was not alone among the Negroes on the Shari River, for at his death he divided the kingdom among the three best men, of one whom was white, while the other two were black. The grandson of this second white man is described by tradition as being a mulatto, and it was this mulatto. And before we get to that second part, let me. Um, so uh, so here's where it says the Bushongo by a white man. And you see this this uh, footnote number here This footnote number four. So let's go to footnote number four before we go to the next page. So he says the Negroes regularly apply the term white to anyone paler than themselves. And it has often been applied to men from the Nile Valley. The slave hunters from Khartoum earned the name White Devils from their victims. See this particular source. Similarly, the Azande called the Egyptian troops who occupied their country by a name Azudia, which Im implies paleness. So keep this in mind that we... we we, we cited Jean-Claude Emboli earlier. Jean-Claude Emboli is, um, quote unquote, half a Zande, right? 
And so either his mother or father is a Zande. The Zande, um, uh, Jean Claude Mboli is from the Republic of Congo in Central Africa. And the there are Zande who live there. That's where he was born and you know his mother and father met. But the Azande people come from the Sudan. So these these are folks who lived in quote unquote Nubia and migrated into Central Africa. So Jean-Claude Hemboli is himself um, from these from from the Azande people. And and so it's ironic that when we when we go back and 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 describe so so remember Jean Claude Mboli is of a Zande descent. He says, "What astonished me when I went to the French Caribes for the first time is the fact that I found a lot of people that declare being black, whereas for me they are white. Without any doubt, it's this experience that pushed me to consider race as a social construct." So we have confirmation of what he was talking about via G.A. Wainwright from 1949, talking about the uh, Azande people calling the Egyptians white. Right? So, so let's go back here so we can uh, have some continuity. So he said, the grandson of this second white man is described by tradition as being a mulatto. And it was to this mulatto that the original deified white man in quotes made the revelation the recipient of the revelation was reigning about ad 510 the date at which the knowledge of the iron industry and the use of egyptian bow bellows was taught on the shari is significant it is just a century and a half after Azana's devastation of the country of Moreau and final destruction of the city with its vast iron smelting industry, which took place about AD 350. So you're starting to see these migrations of, of people coming from the Nile uh, into West Africa. You know, the, the first wave, first major wave is the result of the invasions coming into Egypt. So there was there were six migrations that happened in in the northern part of Africa going into Senegal, right? And and we have that discussion in, in a different uh, video. But then you also had a wave of of Egyptians moving south, uh, going in and uh, living amongst the uh, the people in Moro, and the Moro kingdom fell. And after the Moro kingdom fell these people moved further west um into lake chad and places like nigeria and ghana and things of this nature so this is this is where uh when you go to these places in west africa and there's certain families that talk about the ancestors came from uh, um egypt they're not lying right so we continue Clearly, then, the original, quote unquote, white man moved out from the Nile Valley and drifted away to the West. And as has been seen, he was not alone. Besides all this, the mulatto himself introduced the practice of circumcision, which again is Egyptian. Over and above the iron industry and circumcision, the Bushongo have acquired at least one religious belief from Egypt. It is in multiple souls, which, of course, is derived from Egyptian belief in the Ka. Hence, it is very clear that it was a strong infiltration of Egyptian, actually Marotic culture, which originated that of the Bushongo. It is also clear that the disaster to Moreau resulted in an increase of civilization in the country of the Shari on the south of Lake Chad. In fact, the increase was such that to later generations, it appeared as the creation of the world. Right. So. You know, um, I, I, I've had different shows before where I talked about uh, the the migrations of uh, of Egyptians and people coming from the Sudan into West Africa. So I won't go through all the details of, of that again, but I'll just just highlight some of the slides that I had before in those previous conversations. So here is a 
an amulet uh, or a, a piece of jewelry here. Um, the, the caption says, the treasures of Nubian queen Amina Shaketo. Um, this is about 10 BC to zero. Um, was the daughter of a queen and the wife of a brother whom she survived. Her successor was her daughter Aminatore, who is mentioned in the Bible, right? So you can see this amulet here, I mean, this piece of jewelry here with the uh, the almond ram head with the with that, you know, that kind of um, half circle necklace and you see these cowrie shells here. And, and it should be known that cowrie shells originate in east africa in egypt so all the cowrie shells that you find people have in west africa is because of these migrations and interactions and trade because that was the currency at that time so just the very fact that you see west african art and divination with cowrie shells they it did not originate there it got there because of interactions the interactions of various types coming from um, Sudan and Egypt, right? So keep in mind, I don't know how well you can really see that on your screen, but um, I also cite this, this text here. So this is a text from 1969. It's an edited text that says, Lectures on Nigerian Prehistory and Archaeology, edited by Thurston Shaw. And so there's an article, a chapter there written by Graham Kona, and he says in the text, it does seem that at least in part, the Yoruba did have some sort of Sudanic origin and were not originally all forest zone dwellers. Thus, the modern Yoruba are very likely a composite product resulting from the intermixing of people already in the forest with others emanating from the Sudanic zone. Right. And and so this is this is this is why we see certain things uh, in, in, in conflicting histories when it comes to the Yoruba, because the real Yoruba or their, their real name is called Nago or the Nok. When you when you when you uh, read about Nok culture, that is Yoruba. That's like the kind of proto Yoruba. Right. But but that Nok tradition emerges as soon as the Marotic uh, tradition, you know, falls, right? And, and it forced the, the wars and things, forced the migrations westward. So that's a different conversation for a different day, but it's related to this. So this is why you see in, in, in areas like Benin and Nigeria, this type of artwork. So that, that metallurgy, you know, um, that, that came from 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 Egypt and Moreau, you know, was brought here and they brought their designs and creatives. So like, but they didn't have the cowrie shells just yet, but they still had the memory. And this is why you see this um, from this time. So this is this is ancient. I mean, this is this is old. This isn't modern uh, Yoruba work here. Right. And so this is this is Benin. And so this uh, is another um, you look at this, you think this is ancient Egyptian. It's not. It, it's a it's an Amun um, among the Yoruba, right? So this is a pendant and ram hand from the 17th to the 19th centuries. Medium brass is from the Edo people, right? And you can see the same design. Like you know, uh, it's it's not a coincidence. This comes directly. This this tradition. From these these metallurgists and priests and artisans coming directly from the Nile Valley into West Africa, and so you see another. This is a plaque with ram's head on it from um, Nigeria, right? And um, and so it says metal collection number twelve three fifty one. Such a U shaped pendants were worn by the Oba, the king and important dignitaries attached to a belt around the waist for a comparable object, see Ezra, yada, yada, yada. All right, and I have the source materials in the other side. So this is just another uh, view here. So it says the uh, Papa Hoard. Um, the Papa Hoard is an important collection of medieval bronze jewelry found at a Papa near Lagos, Nigeria, dating to the early 16th century, right? So that's the 1500s. 
the hoard has been part of the British Museum's collection since 1930. Right. So these this this is a direct um, uh, expression of marotic art. Right. So when you see this, for example, this child of Yoruba God or Batala from Ile Ife, Nigeria, dated between 1000 and 1500 A.D. Right. So you see in here and their ver their version of the God best. And you see the, the the similarities here. The and so that's why I'm saying the note culture. This is this is you know um, excerpts from that note culture um, is is a direct response, um, a direct creation of the interactions of the people coming out of Egypt and Moro that moved into what is now called Nigeria. And so you can see the skull pendant here on on this um, this this work here. And, and then you see the skull pendant over here in uh, ancient Egypt. So this is at the Louvre Museum, right? And so these, these aren't coincidences. They just didn't independently, you know, create these things. There was interactions, migration, settling. And so that's why, you know, it's, it's really silly when, when people try to argue, for example, that African-Americans aren't related to ancient Egyptians. It's stupid, you know, because those those genetic blood lineages found their way into western africa and then you know the their descendants partial of them you know found themselves wound up on the wrong side of the slave trade right so this is this is why it's important uh to to have these particular conversations because when you're looking at the ancient egyptians themselves Right. They're talking about this influx of these white people coming in. They're not white. They're they're um, just lighter than the people that interacted. So when the Egyptians like this, this name here, this this person. here. So this statue is of an uh, a person by the name of Ni Unk Pepe Kim. Now, people believe the Kim in the name refers to black and is descriptive of his actual skin color which it is not his skin color is that of what we call desher red right and you see this consistently so this is the word so this is desher um in the hieroglyphs right here the, the word for red and this is an example over here this is the god ra and the, with the sun disc on his head and the sun is depicted as red multiple times so here's the sun here in the aket uh, this is another um, variant of Ra, and then here's the the sun here, and even his skin color is of the the depiction of the sun. And just as a side note, we see this red, black, and green motif going on, you know, uh, in ancient Egypt. So the mere fact that we rock the red, black, and green is 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 ancient as hell. And and here's his proof from the primary, right? So. And, and just to show that this is not a misconception, at the bottom here, you see this word, the shirt T, meaning red one, therefore the sun god. And here's uh, one of the sources you can find it in, the Waterbush Book 5, right? So when they, when they view the sun, the sun is the color red. And it is this um, color that the Egyptians depicted themselves not black right is as we would think of the color black the deep deep rich black they in modern times we would consider these people black folks but indigenously in africa these are white folks right and you know here's just a you know from the the new tla where you can see the that word the shirt t Right. In relationship to the sun god. Right. So when you go look it up, this is this is what they'll show you. Right. And so here's uh, the same person in, in his tomb. That's Ni Unk Pepe Kim. And you can see the, the reddish skin color. Right. This is Desher. They depicted themselves in a different hues of desher 
Now, this is Kim. But this depiction, they only, for the most part, use this skin tone to reference those from the from from Sudan that is closely related to like these folks. So this is the depiction of the new air and the Dinka in ancient Egyptian reliefs. And you can see a modern photo, you know, you can see the red hair here and the high forehead, you know, going back in the hairline, going back, you see that right here. Uh, so this is, this is an accurate depiction. Now it's a little bit exaggerated in terms of the blackness, but when you, you consider how deeply black they are in comparison to the Egyptians, the, the Remetch themselves, this is, you know, this is the contrast here. But even though his name is Kim, they're not talking about a, a physical, um, like, like black color. And it's not in the same racial context. Like you don't see that in, in, in Africa. Right. So when they when they talk about black, this is black. Right. When you, when you see some folks of this hue. This is Kim in as it refers to skin color. Right. And they perfectly depict this in the in the Egyptian reliefs like we see here, you know, and, and very well detailed. So we can say that, you know, the Dinka and the Nuer have been wearing the leopard skins and the cheetah skins for a very long time that we see here because we see it in the ancient Egyptian reliefs. And, then, and this same hairstyle, right? The same color in a hairstyle, right? So when you when you say Kim in, in a black skin, this is exactly what you see on the screen here, right? And, and this is the kind of blackness that you see in Senegal and in Nigeria and things of this nature. That's why when they call, when they see people of brown hue and lighter, they call them whites in red and so the idea of even labeling uh individuals in in terms of their skin tone is is it's uh is different on the continent of africa and so i uh, i just wanted to have that conversation and let me see i just wanted to have that conversation uh on in relationship to the 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 ongoing conversation that we we've been having on this concept of race so the the as i stated at the beginning of the conversation that when we're doing this kind of research i would not be considered black according to to some of these uh african folks because my hue is is brownish red right and i have brothers that are um i have two brothers that are lighter than me my dad is, is lighter than me, right? But in America, we're all black. And, and, and so the point of this, or one of the major points of this is that when we're doing the research, we have to understand our position and how our upbringing and thinking can cloud our research. And this is why we don't do this is why we we have such things called you know african centered because when we're when we're talking about african people we want to come from the lens of african people and so you know we're I, i'm giving you primary text here and so of course there's there's going to be 800 videos of, of people trying to rebut this uh but they can't right so so these are the kinds of things that you have to think about when you're doing research and you're kind of organizing your thoughts. And let me just stop sharing the screen uh, there. And so um, I haven't kept up too much with any of the comments, so I'll try to uh, address some things. And if you have any questions, I will, you know, entertain maybe about like 10 minutes or so. Uh, any any questions and but before then um commercial break yeah yeah tokyo wanna know that 
What's up? Feel it like I dropped the drop for a car uno. Came to kick the door with the game man judo. Pin game low. That's why they give me kudos. Inspired by the 3 0. 5 9 5 check it for a pack light. Hit the turn price line to a baseline. Got a sound like I just hit the 8 5. Oh, I'm so ready. My enemies necessary. We gon' be legendary. Hold up. Mm. About to grow the payrolls. If you see the vision and you're with it, you should say so. Cause we about to elevate in the millions. So make sure that you get your copy of and the light is bright on that cover. Uh, Race and Identity in Ancient Egypt, Volume 1. You can uh, go to asarmhotep.com and uh, purchase there. And so love and light to each and every one of you who have already uh, supported the work and have uh, gotten your copies already. And so um let me just scroll up real quick uh let me see what comments were made uh that's right it says committee is an endonym they didn't even identify uh that as their name you you find a couple of uh references to that but this is like in the late greek period and, and that doesn't mean commit to you is just it's just like saying a New Yorker that that doesn't mean that you physically represent whatever the word York means uh, in in wherever language that word comes from. It just means that you are of you're in relation to the place New York. And so, you know, um, yeah, the ER in English would would be considered the quote unquote Nisby. Uh, of, uh, of ancient Egypt, or at least one of them. So you could say a New Yorkian. If I say I'm a Houstonian, right? The N at the end is the the morpheme that talks about the relation uh, in terms of you know where I dwell and where I live. And so, commit to you is only it's a place name. So it's only in reference to the place name. It's not it's not used in a descriptive sense. So you, you would not see it in a, like in an adjectival form describing anybody in a sentence using that word. So uh, not paint them bright light. They have a different word for white. Yeah. Well, again, the the that's why I made sure that it was a linguist and a native speaker. And so they, they say it's, it's a word that means white. And, and etymologically, it's a word meaning uh, to shine in light. And so it's, it's dealing with a range of like a, a, a anywhere from like red, yellow to the extreme white in which we know. And uh, and so that in that red range is really kind of the, the, the brown that you would be called brony for, like for the Fulani. Um, names can also be given on the day, the season a child is born. Exactly. Um, so do you know of any cognizance to the Egyptian deity Atum? Um, yes, I do. And if you get the book, you'll find it in the text. Um, names can be given based on circumstance to a child is born in the Luba culture. Uh, yeah, so even when I cited that, those were uh, birth circumstance names. But it, you, you get names all throughout your life and for different reasons. And so, you know, there, there has to be a, a separate study. Uh, on, for example, on ancient Egyptian naming practices and the like. And um, so that's that's what's really missing, you know, from, from the conversation. There's, there's actually some text done on that. Uh, but uh, but that's another conversation. So it says, my skin is derived from the sun. Um, did he encounter a group of Rachel Doza? <laughs> So, so euros were correctly identified as Caucasians. Caucasians is a different thing. And big up to Brother Shakara Speaks. Thanks for joining the conversation as well as Musa and Skele. I, I, I never pronounce his right, his name right. Skele. Skele. You know, the X sounds different in different languages. And peace our good brother Zoo 221 in the building. And Octotorp says he got to step out. Uh, we'll check the rest later indeed. So we learn together with Obam. So metallurgy is inherited or comes from Egypt. There, there could be um, 
so you can you can kind of invent metallurgy independently but there's just certain techniques so that's why like when when you read in the text of which i just cite you see um certain bellows that's that's what you know blows the air those are the egyptian type and so it would be a hell of a coincidence to to not only um invent metallurgy separate but to have the exact same form of the bellows and things that you find in ancient egypt uh that you find in places of west africa and so in matter of fact the even the terms for metal amongst the yoruba and even amongst the wolof are found in ancient egypt which tells us that there's there's certain aspects of the the whole metallurgical process that was um brought over west and and so you know that's a conversation that that needs to be uh had in a very serious and organized way um in my experience the notion that light skinned africans are referred to as white seems to be based on anecdotal evidence and best some from ghana and i'm fluent in four african languages maybe so but you know that's why i, I picked the source of a native african linguist on this manner and and this is something that i've been been hearing from folks uh and this is why it can't be anecdotal in terms of just uh personal it's, it's based on the study uh and, and this is and and of course I, I cited other areas which discuss and give the same thing so so from from chad to yoruba land to central africa and in ghana when they refer to light skin and they see pale or light-skinned Africans they call them white in that language or anything dealing with paleness right um this is the name light-skinned Africans are not called white they are actually referred to as red no there's a variation and, and again red and that's why I, I uh made the the comment that it has to deal it's a range so you know it's it's because those words aren't used for red in the languages. And so he says, we sing this between different skin tones. You may do that now. And this is why I made sure that I cited earlier text as well. Because, you know, the, the more you interact with Europeans, the more you um, start to pick up their ways and, and looking at things. So this is one of the things that we learn in linguistics is that when you're looking at African language, when you're looking at world languages, and you're dealing with numbers and you're dealing with colors you can't try to understand it strictly based upon english ideas of number and color because for example in in many languages what we would call blue green and black are all the same word in the same language and so it's it's the same when you're talking about these these words for for white kind of yellowish red right they're they're the same word and 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 that's why we go with, into the linguistics and we see how they evolve and and are tracked in that different way because it has to deal the word the root of the word has to deal with light and so that's why for example let's let's go back into the source material and this is why you always uh deal with the the scholarship at hand so let me uh, make that bigger and let me do this. And so we're going to go back to uh, that term. So here we go. So notice that that BR root in the in the tree language is is the same word for plantain and bread. Right. And dealing with European people in terms of their um their skin color but it's also for corn and maize corn and maize is not red it is it is white and yellow so we're dealing with a range here and and this is why we don't go off of anecdotal uh evidence or lack thereof right so uh let me see what he says. So this way of categorizing people on their skin tone is not unique in Ghana. So the linguistic uh, nuances is this another African language as well. You must have came late to the conversation. Uh, 
because all that was already covered um so his name may have kim in it but it's not referring to his skin tone it says the skeptics are fuming red i can tell you that much of course he says i could argue that white began to displace red as contact with arab european uh, hegemonies took place possible and i don't know what eie is <laughs> he said, I predict 10 follow up shows. Indeed. Uh, so when is it for Uncle Chef White? Yeah, Uncle Chef of White folks. You know, and, and that's what I'm saying. Like, it's that's why it's that's why I, I, I titled the show, you know, um, Special Social Relativity because. This is why we always got to be careful and mindful of our own social constructs and biases when doing research. Because how we see the world and we're trying to report on other people may may uh, skew the data and, and you be going into these circular arguments. You know, and so, so that's why I bring up Neon Pepe. Uh, uh, yeah, Neon Pepe Kim, because and we answer in the book why they're named that way but the you you have to wonder if kim because you you never see the word kim being used in reference to things that are uh red or or, or lighter in that in that uh, color range right outside of some symbolic things and they're just using colors uh randomly right and so for for kim for him to be named kim but him in every single depiction is of him is as desha red and every in in and that is the typical ancient egyptian way that they depict themselves in my skin color and lighter right this it it's you have to have a different conversation he says, by all metrics, the Dinka would probably call all of Africa white. <laughs> Possibly. I need to ask somebody. I need to uh, holler at my Dinka friends. He says, the Egyptians were not Congo black. Yes, they were. You know, because you had some folks who, who were Congo black who lived and were Egyptians. That's why I started the conversation with, with this quote. Oops, let me represent. Uh, right. This this why I started the conversation in in this fashion. So let me go back with with this quote here, and let me see. Uh, oh, let me uh, let me remove that comment first and go back. So here we go. So that's why I started the conversation with the the argument made by dr william a cooney in his phd dissertation egypt's encounter with the west race culture and identity he said being egyptian in the ancient world therefore is a complex phenomenon which cannot be tied exclusively to primordialist or instrumentalist perspectives of ethnic identity but is quite clearly a conflation of both of them an egyptian was not merely someone who lived within the boundaries of egypt he said not merely nor a person who practiced Egyptian religion or spoke Egyptian. An Egyptian could be all of these or none of these. So it's just like you like if you say you're an American, an American is not attached to a a uh, a skin color per se. Even if the majority of people, or at least now, are, are, are pale Europeans, right? But they're going to be out numbered in a few years by the latino community of a, uh, a slightly darker hue right but and so when you when you have these these uh dark africans who who live in ancient egypt and are born in ancient egypt and speak egyptian language and exist within egyptian culture they're egyptians so this is why 
it is is that's why he starts off the conversation it is a complex phenomenon it is not it's you know uh simple people trying to oversimplify the the concept of ancient egyptian identity and it is it is not it, it, in the pseudo scientific way that Europeans have tried to make identity here in the United States, and and this is just a fact that everyone's going to have to live with, you know. And so you you can't use pseudo scientific uh, racial constructs and and argue against their non validity within the scientific realm, and then try to use it to to make arguments about the ancient egyptians it just don't work that way right so and thank you sister uh, mika uh reminding you all to big up the video and share and you know continue to support the channel and let me see. He says the African Iron Age was before the European. Maybe, maybe so. so uh, I see that in Gabia also. They call light skinned folks white also. Yeah, it's, it's, I see it. I've heard it myself. I've, I've, I've done the analysis. Like, it's, it's, they call them whites. So whatever the word is for white and bright in their language, they have various variations of it, right? And, um, I'm assuming, I don't know what these words mean, but I'm assuming that's Wolof. Uh, let me see. Yeah. Sinasar, are you familiar with the Samba tribe? Sam meaning farm. Um, I don't think, not right off the top of my head. No, but um, I'll definitely look into uh, that. He said, the Brony and Chui denotes non-African foreigner. The BR plants you show all have BR because they're foreign plants. Uh, never mind. Can't argue with some people. The ancient Egyptian words for skin are the same words they use for leather and animal hide because their skin complexion was dark brown. Three of the words were Muska and them and the hair. That's discussed in the text. Um, he says, sorry, I'm making a good point. That's absolutely well. They ain't using the term Kim to refer to their complexions at all. Uh, he says, stop, the ancient Egyptians were racist. Uh, he's referring to the quote that I just uh, had. And the way that he said it, he said that, you know, there was scholarly debate on whether the Egyptians were racist because of um, certain attitudes that they had against foreign groups. All right. This is not like your first point, um, Better King Jason. All right. They have their own conversation. So, you know, I, I hope what I conveyed here is that the, the conversation is very nuanced and, you know, is, is not uh, going to be um, like a cut and dry thing is going to force you to define things definitively and then work your your conversation based upon um you know that information and knowledge and so this is all the things that i had to deal with over the years so i'm not i'm not just coming to the conversation just just because i'm uh, uh trying to get at somebody on on youtube or facebook it, it is far beyond this is a bona fide study and, I, and i've had to go on like i had to do a whole study on you know toponyms in in africa because i want to know what is the what is the tradition in Africa for how they name spaces? I had to do a whole study on anthroponymy, right? Like how people and why people name each other the way that they do, right? Um, of course, you had the, the linguistic studies, but you had to do certain archaeological studies, certain botanical studies, right? Certain uh, uh, studies in regards to, you know, the, the fauna in an area. Right. I had to do oral studies, migrations, you know, studies on metallurgy and the like. And, and these are the kinds of things that we're going to be hitting on in volumes two and three. You know, but people all caught up in the word like the the, the Kemet argument is, is just so at the bottom of the tier when it comes to this uh, this particular conversation. here, Right. So. 
Uh, I don't see any more questions. So, and we, uh, we appreciate you uh, as well. And thank you all for uh, joining the conversation. And we're going to keep the conversation going. So there's 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 many aspects. Again, the book is 500 pages and I cover so many things that I can never just do one show and, and, and deal with the books. It's, it's, it's so many arguments going on because that is what is necessary when trying to narrow down these issues of uh, ethnicity and identity in the African world. And so uh, I'll end it with this comment. Yeah, they can use Kim for their complexions at times, but we have to be well enough to not force our definition of that. Yeah, because if, if the word Kim also means dark, it could be darker. Like if if, if it's two brothers, right? Like if uh, I have to show you all a picture of like one of my my, my my youngest brother, right? He's he's a lot brighter than me, but he's not like bright. He's not Beyonce bright but he's he's of a lighter hue than me so if if my if my um parents you know uh at a later time remember i'm the oldest so he's 12 years younger than i am so we wouldn't have gotten these names at birth these would have been names later on at least after the youngest was born but i would be you know um asar imhotep kim all right or harold johnson kim Right. And he would be Joseph Johnson Desher. Right. Or or Hedge, you know, what I'm saying for white, whatever to, to distinguish. But that wouldn't be a good distinct. But it would be like a nickname. I'd be slightly darker than him. But, you know, so who's the reference to? So like like it, you always have to when you when you have these conversations, you always have to ask the question in reference in contrast to what? So if they're naming themselves Kim, Kim in contrast to to who? To what? And, and, and what's the context? Why would you just name somebody like and there's no guarantee that the Kims and all the names where there's Kim it has anything to do with black. And, and, you know, this is this is a consistent error that a lot of these um, these people keep making. They just automatically assume everything is is Kim black. And there's there's dozens of other Kim words in the language. Right. And so then you got to think about time period is it has to deal with a family, as I discuss in the text. You know the 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 scholarship on this phenomenon like if you because you you have people with the same name in in a family or within an, an organization so to distinguish between people with the same name they'll just give a separator so somebody will be named kim somebody will be named desher it doesn't mean that their skin complexions are red and black it's that they have the same name and this in this phenomenon still goes on in Egypt today, just within Arabic. Now they use the Arabic language. And so you have instead of red and black, you have black and white. So there's Muhammad, the black Muhammad, the white. Because, you know, for some reason, um, Arabs only have like two names in their language that everybody's Muhammad. Muhammad, Muhammad, Muhammad. So with with a hundred thousand Muhammads, you know there is uh, you you have to be able to distinguish when you have people who have the same name. And our brother Sheffern says, "Is there a Kim in reference to water?" Technically, yes, and it's discussed in the book. Matter of fact, chapters two and chapters three. It says. Uh, yo, I'm done. Anthroponomastics should learn today. <laughs> Indeed. All righty, y'all. So um, remember that um, I have another show premiering in a couple of hours, actually at 9 p.m. And we're going to be addressing some commentary uh, made by Comgiverse and on and regarding some linguistic matters. So um, it, it's going to premiere tonight. So it's pre-recorded. And so until next time, hold up.